After the city of Dallas was vilified in the aftermath of the assassination of President John F. Kennedy 50 years ago, we'll look at what was said and how it impacted Dallas and its citizens. We'll also take a look at how the Sixth Floor Museum came about, what it contains today, and why you should take a tour soon to see what marvelous history it contains. So let's meet the panel. First on my left is Stephen Fagan. He joined the Sixth Floor Museum at Dealey Plaza in 2000, where he serves as associate curator and oral historian. He's the author of this book, Assassination and Commemoration, and he's also written an article about a guy named Lee Harvey Oswald. Perhaps many of you have heard of him. Stephen, welcome to the program. Thank you. Happy to be here. Sitting next to you is a, a legend in Dallas. His name is Wes Wise, and for those of us who've been around a while, uh, we know that he was, first of all, a sports broadcaster, which was kind of a nice thing back in the old days, and he was involved in uh, many things, including the visit to Dallas in October of 1963 by Adlai Stevenson when that uh, lady hit him with a placard, so he was involved in that. But I think uh, many of you may remember him as a mayor of Dallas from 1971 to 1976. And of course, uh, he also had the opportunity to know Jack Ruby and visited with him on November the 23rd, 1963. So Wes, let me just start with you. Take us back just a little bit into that late 1963 thing and then bring us up to date as to how Dallas has been seen since that time. Well, of course, Dallas was a mainstay of uh, some expressionism, for want of a better term. The National Indignation Committee, which nobody could figure out what that was. The John Birch Society Regional Headquarters were here. Uh, the, uh, the Hunt program, radio program, was on every day and was considered to be fairly extremist by, by many people. Uh, it seemed that Dallas had a, a, a reputation of uh, people with extreme motives and extreme politi political views uh, coming here and working against each other. Uh, General Walker had been uh, deprived of his, uh, of his commission as a result of preaching to his troops and uh, moved to a home, a very fashionable home on Turtle Creek Boulevard and used to fly his American flag upside down. And of course this mystified and and, uh, and really uh, rubbed a lot, of, a lot of people in Dallas the wrong way. Dallas was known, and is still known in my opinion, as a very patriotic city. Right. And it has nothing to do with Republican, Democrat, liberal, or conservative. It is a very patriotic city. So uh, for some reason, uh, one that I believe I'll never quite imagine why, uh, it seemed to th these elements seemed to feed on each other. And then of course the Adley Stevenson attack was sort of a, of a, a culmination of that almost exactly one month before the uh, uh, arrival of President Kennedy. Okay, good. Let me stop you there for just a second because you mentioned General Walker and nobody in Dallas knew this until after uh, Lee Harvey Oswald was captured and then uh, unfortunately um, uh, murdered two days later before he got to stand trial. But he's the actual person who took that shot at General Walker and probably would have killed General Walker if it hadn't hit a part of a window pane on the way in, as I understand it. Is that your understanding as well? That's my understanding. I've often wondered if he had struck General Walker, even if he had not killed him, uh, would that have changed everything to where JFK would never have been assassinated? Isn't that interesting? We'll never know. But, but another irony of that is General Walker was known as an extremist in, uh, in, the, in the right view, in, in the con ultra-conservative view. JFK, of course, was known as by many people as an extremist on the liberal view. Mm -hmm. yeah. And here, the same gunman tried to, to assassinate each one of them. Yeah, probably talks more about the gunman than his politics in some ways. In fact, uh, he, as we know, Lee Harvey Oswald was a, was a practicing communist, whatever he described it as that day. Now, the Adlai Stevenson thing that you've talked about, and in fact is in the book that you wrote as well, where uh, he was the United Nations ambassador, came here, made a speech, you covered it, as it turns out, you were a sports reporter, but you got the camera and took the video. Uh, tell us what Ro uh, Walter Cronkite did with that video on uh, CBS News. Well, if, as I was taking the pictures of uh, the camera with this old-fashioned Bell and Howell camera with the big uh, floodlight that many people, well, I think most people in this audience would be old enough to remember, uh, uh, I was taking pictures of him leaving the uh, audience of the UN Day celebration at the theater next to the Dallas Convention Center. And uh, there had been much upheaval uh, in the audience, and uh, Jim Underwood, who was the, uh, the assistant news director, and I were there to cover it. And as he came out of the, the coverage, 
Uh, I went over and took the only pictures, the only moving pictures that, that I know of that I've ever, ever heard of, of his being uh, hit over the head by a woman with a placard hit over the, the ear and the head. And the woman later said that, uh, and I, I must tell you this, I'm, I'm quoting her now, uh, a Negro struck my arm from behind and made me uh, bring down the placard. Well, Walter Cronkite on the news that night uh, played that film over and over and backed it up and back, backwards and forwards, and there was no black face anywhere to be seen in that picture at all. And as a result of that, the, the rumor was after that that the National Football League made the playback and, and the back and forward movement uh, regular of their Sunday broadcast. Yeah, at least something good that came out of it, I guess. <laughs> now, uh, Stephen. The Sixth Floor Museum is a very interesting uh, place, and one of the things that, that w there are not only some problems as Wes was talking about leading up to the assassination, but in the wake of the assassination, what what was going on? You you're too young to remember that, but you've been told that. what was going on around the country in terms of their attitudes toward Dallas in the wake of the assassination in November of '63. Dallas was vilified in the aftermath of the assassination. Um, phrases such as uh, city of hate, city of shame were regularly used uh, in the museum's archives. We have a number of examples of, of, of Dallasites who would travel out of town and be treated badly, having rocks thrown at their car or change thrown in their face or having long distance telephone calls uh, disconnected. Uh, my favorite example, because it's so telling, uh, it comes from our oral history project. I interviewed uh, a lady who was a young schoolgirl in 1963 and her family had just moved from the East Coast to Dallas. And that year, that Christmas, she received a Christmas card from an East Coast relative and it was delivered to her door and it was addressed to Shame on You, Texas, not Dallas. Wow. And I, I think that's a telling example of how people around the world saw this city uh, for many of the reasons Wes discussed. The, um, the atmosphere which many would describe as toxic, uh, uh, enabling an individual like Lee Harvey Oswald to uh, commit this, commit this uh, treacherous act. Uh, people viewed Dallas as a city that, well, in the words of the New York Times, a city, city not too many decades removed from the vigilante traditions of the old frontier. Mm -hmm. And that was a stigma that took a, a long time, decades, for Dallas to shed, and uh, in, in coming together the, the museum and saving the Texas School Book Depository, I think that's all reflective of this international attitude towards the city. All right, you mentioned uh, oral history, and I mentioned in my introduction that you're in charge of that project. Tell that viewer what that is and how somebody watching this program might want to get involved in it. Well, the Oral History Project at the Sixth Floor Museum is a dynamic and ongoing initiative we've been doing since the institution opened almost 25 years ago. It's a, a collection of audiovisual interviews with people from around the world reflecting on the life, death, and legacy of President Kennedy and the history and culture of the time period. Anyone with a story to share, no matter where they were living at the time, uh, they're welcome to contact the museum uh, via our website, jfk.org, if they want to be part of this tapestry of living history and, and share their story with us. Well, good. I hope they will, and hope yeah. they'll share it before it's too late. Absolutely. All right, good. So, Wes, so here you are in the broadcast business in 63 and continuing on past that. And I'm unclear, correct me, because uh, I don't remember, were you still in the broadcast business when you ran for mayor, or did you do something else in between? No, I decided to get into something honest, so I decided to get into politics. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I just made that decision in 1968, ran for the city council, had a full term on the city council before I first ran for mayor and was elected in 1971. I might mention that Steve was talking about the museum. Uh, perhaps you're going to get into this, but there was a real movement afoot uh, during the time I was mayor to tear down the building. Uh, people in Dallas thought it was a blot on the, on the reputation of the city and, and on the city itself. And I'll never forget John Connolly himself uh, spoke to me once on the telephone. He said, Wes, as mayor, don't let them tear that building down because if you do, people are already saying that the city of Dallas and the police of Dallas were a part of the conspiracy to kill the president. If, they, if you tear that, let that building be torn down, which of course I could not do, uh, but the city council could, could have something to do with it. If, if, if that building is torn down, people will accuse Dallas of uh, trying to destroy evidence. 
Well, and you were you stood uh, fast there and held your ground. Now I'm going to show that viewer some graphics that uh, we're going to start with the view of that building and how it's been made to look really neat these days. There's graphic number one. That's an excellent picture of the school book depository building. Here are some others. Let's look at graphic two. This shows you the sixth floor. The um, on the far right hand corner is the where the sniper's nest was, not on the very high thing up, but the one just below it there. The next graphic is 2A, and that's another view of it looking up at the sixth floor and the seventh floor. And then let's look at graphic 4, and that's a, a very nice picture of Dealey Plaza, and you can see the whole thing looking up with the school book depository building being on your left there, looking up the grassy knoll is off to the left. And then let's see graphic five. And graphic five is an interior of the um, school book uh, depository, which is the sixth floor museum now. Let's look at graphic six. That's another view of the exhibits. And if you, again, if you haven't been there in a while, you really uh, should go. That's the investigations there. Let's look at the next graphic as well. And that's called the press room there. Uh, on another program in this series, we talked a lot about Kennedy and Johnson and how they got together and how they won the election in 1960. And then let's look at the sniper's nest. This is looking in it from outside because it's sort of cordoned off there. And then let's see that last one there, which is a view from where Lee Harvey Oswald fired those uh, shots on November 22nd, 1963, looking down uh, Elm Street toward the triple overpass. So. Uh, Steve and I imagine that you and, and, uh, and Gary Mack have, have really had a great time doing what you're doing here. But tell us what a curator is and how does that, <laughs> how does that work in terms of what the Sixth Floor Museum is all about? Well, as far as my responsibility at the museum, uh, one of the things I do is manage this ongoing oral history project, record all the interviews, uh, archive them, and make them accessible to students, teachers, researchers, historians from all over the world via our reading room, which is an on-site research center where uh, people can come, book an appointment, and access our oral histories, our photograph collections, our video collections, and, uh, and artifacts. Uh, I also work on uh, collections, exhibits, education, and public programming. We do a lot. Uh, we're the second most visited historic site in the state of Texas behind the Alamo uh, with an annual attendance of about 350,000 people, which is really good for a history museum. Two-thirds of our audience were born after 1963, and so that presents a unique challenge about communicating and interpreting history and informing people that walk in our doors not really aware of who John F. Kennedy is, who Lee Harvey Oswald is, who Jack Ruby is. Um, we have to invest them in that journey. Part of the exhibit narrative is introducing President Kennedy and introducing the flavor and the spirit of the 1960s so that by the time you get to that sniper's nest window, you are in, invested in the journey and you can appreciate the international magnitude that the death of President Kennedy had on the nation and the world. Well, you mentioned also, uh, Wes was talking about in the 70s, there was a movement to try to tear down the building. Uh, the Sixth Floor Museum in the Texas School Book Depository didn't come about even then. What were some of the problems even on up to 1989 with creating a museum? Well, the Texas School Book Depository Company, the distribution textbook uh, company, they moved out in 1970. Almost immediately, uh, there was a public outcry to tear down the building. Uh, it went on the auction block, and a, a music promoter from Nashville, Tennessee, bought the building at auction with a, a grand plan of transforming the building into a museum and research center, but he had no financial backing. There was an arson attempt that caused thousands of dollars worth of damage, and, and at that moment, uh, there in the, in the uh, early 1970s, around 1972, people began looking at this thinking, there's a possibility of commercial exploitation at this very s fragile site, fragile in the psyche of Dallas, and perhaps it would be better to demolish the building, uh, this manifestation of evil, as if to erase the memories of the assassination. And that is when the city council stepped in. And Dallas and the building could have no better champion than this man right here. Uh, the, the citizens of Dallas, anyone who's ever visited the museum and been touched by the exhibits really owes a debt of gratitude to Wes Wise as well as the uh, Dallas County Public Works Director Judson Shook who arranged for the county to buy the building as well as um, 
the two ladies responsible for making the sixth floor exhibition a reality, Lyndall and Adams and Conover Hunt, uh, these individuals, really a, a grass, grassroots network of community leadership, stepped up to the plate and said, we cannot let this building be demolished. We cannot let history forget the assassination. We need to have a place for the million people plus that visit Dealey Plaza each year to appreciate and understand the magnitude of this historic space. Good. I appreciate that. I'm uh, joined here by Pierce Alma. Now, Pierce, um, you were obviously there on November 22nd, 1963, and on another program, you're going to give us the idea about what that was like. But give us some idea about the aftermath and from a Dallas perspective. You've been around here a long time. You've seen this. You hear what we're talking about here. Give us your perspective, would you? Well, Mr. Kennedy really did not want to make the trip, and yet he knew he had to. Dallas was probably the only major city that he lost in the election, and at the polls, he was running behind Goldwater. So when LBJ and the others said, you need to come down here and unite the party, uh, he decided to do it. And Dallas was very excited because Jackie normally did not make political trips with her husband, but they were grieving over the death of their infant son, so they decided to come. And a great air, as Wes remembers, there was just a great air of anticipation. Everybody was excited, and the motorcade downtown was just absolutely wonderful. And then the happening, the tragedy, and I think the aftermath of that caused, over the weekend, on Saturday and Sunday, intense self-examination, introspection, sort of civic penance on a very large scale. I think a lot of people were beginning to ask, did I do something? Did I somehow cause this atmosphere in which something so tragic could occur? And I know on Sunday morning, the churches were filled. We were actually uh, feeding audio from the First Methodist Church downtown up to ABC. And it, it, everyone was somber. Dallas, and I don't know if Wes, if you remember this, but Dallas got quiet. The sounds of the city ceased, and there was a stillness over everything. And just a few blocks from our studio at the School Book Depository building, people had gathered, and they were sort of just standing around in groups and would look up at the building occasionally or look around at each other and wonder, what happened? What really happened here? And I think Dallas did change after that. For one thing, Mayor Cabell ran for Congress and defeated Bruce Alger. And J. Eric Johnson, who had been president of the Dallas Citizens Council at the time of the luncheon, became mayor and started the marvelous Goals for Dallas program, which reached out to every segment of Dallas and tried to bring people together to think about the common good, what can we do? It was a, I would say almost a time of healing afterwards. Thank you very much for that perspective. I appreciate that. Now, Wes, he mentioned the Dallas Citizens Council. When you ran for mayor in 71, uh, you were not part of the quote establishment. Uh, so uh, was it just because you were such a great sportscaster that made you so popular or what was it? Uh, hmm. I would have to look back in history myself, I guess, to figure <laughs> that out. Uh, I will, will, will say this, I did a whole oral history before Steve came on the scene with uh, Mayor J Eric Johnson. And it was quite an event for me because we had always been known as uh, opposition people, perhaps. Uh, I was unfairly characterized, I think, as being anti-establishment. I don't think I ever was. Uh, and, and, and the, the, uh, the interview that I did with Mayor Johnson was so good that both of us said, hey, we've got to keep this going. And so we did another hour, and I think we did another hour after that. And it's in the, in the, in the archives at the, at the museum. Uh, to, to try to answer your question best, I think there was a feeling that the, the, the opinion that many people had of this uh, city being controlled by a few, and that, that means oligarchy, uh, was not healthy. And so I came on and, and with a, an appeal both to, uh, not ent entirely to, uh, to uh, radical, uh, to, uh, to either the, the Hispanics or blacks, uh, I did appeal to some of the people who were not as well privileged. Good. Now, when you were mayor, you would go to mayor's conferences around the country. And this is 10 years after the assassination. What did you run into then in terms of how Dallas was seen? Well, the most memorable one for me by far was almost exactly 10 years later. It was, it was, in fact, it was 10 years to the day in 1973. I was at a U.S. conference of mayors meeting in Chicago, 
and a group of the mayors who had been in debate all day long uh, were standing around and, and one of the people in the group of about seven or eight mayors of major cities said, uh, Mayor Wise, how does it feel to be mayor of the city that killed the president? Well, I was told later that I clenched my fists. And one of the mayors said he was going to get a hold of me because I, you know, I could start a, a fist fight that would have been the worst thing in the world for Dallas under those circumstances and with that, uh, in, with that as, a, as a cause. So that, that would be probably the thing that I remember most. Uh, I had a lot of people take up for Dallas. I had a lot of people, not just mayors, say, look, that could have happened in our city. It happened in Buffalo. It happened in Washington. Uh, why does Dallas, uh, when, when you say Dallas, you think assassination. When you say Buffalo, you don't think assassination. When you say Washington, you don't think assassination. So I've never quite figured that one out. Interesting. Now, Stephen, you mentioned that, that you think after decades now, we've sort of moved past that. How, how, do, you, how do you figure out what the feeling is among other people, all individually, but I'm grossly simplifying here, but how do you figure all that out these days? As for the future of Dallas, it's so great and it's so bright, and uh, the economics of Dallas is so good, we still attract some of the great uh, Ford, Fortune 500 companies, we still attract new people coming into the area. Um, I think we've shaken that reputation by and large, I really do. And I think as people continue to see the museum, and see uh, John F. Kennedy in, a, in the light that he was shown in the museum very fairly, and, 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 very, and the Dallas, Dallas is shown very fairly, I think that'll change. Here's the JFK Memorial there, Stephen. You, you, that's not exactly in Dealey Plaza, but it's not far away. Uh, tell us what impact you think the Sixth Floor Museum has had on changing this perception. Well, I think the Sixth Floor Museum has become part of our cultural landscape in Dallas. It's emerged from being a site of controversy to being a site of, of, of social engagement and of history and of memory. Uh, Dealey Plaza is a sacred space. Uh, it's, it's very much like Pearl Harbor or the Lorraine Motel in Memphis or the Murrah Building in Oklahoma City or the footprint of the World Trade Center. All of these sites were stained by tragedy, touched by violence, and in Dealey Plaza you can point to a geographic location, which you can't do very, very elsewhere in the United States apart from perhaps a Civil War battlefield, and say world history changed right here in this spot, and I think it will always be a draw to people as, as memory fades to history, and I think that uh, the museum is a part of that experience. It's, uh, it's a reflection of Dallas, it's a reflection of the journey we've taken over this past half century, and it's also a reflection of us as we look beyond the 50th at, at what comes next. And uh, in that respect, and I've said it many times, the Sixth Floor Museum is about us. It's about us as a community uh, facing up to this event and emerging from the long, dark shadow of history. Okay. You, you, the, Wes, go ahead. Almost everybody who uh, has observed Dallas over the, over the years will agree with me, I believe, that two elements really helped the international flavor of Dallas. One, strangely enough, would be the TV series Dallas, which was and it still is being rebroadcast all over the world. And although it shows Dallas in a somewhat uh, negative light in some ways, people realize so somewhat that accurately, this, right, Wes? <laughs> I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. <laughs> but this this was still a great series, and the Dallas Cowboys, without any question, in their day of uh, being America's team and uh, their days of uh, of going to the Super Bowl really helped the reputation of the city of Dallas, especially in the United States, because you would go to uh, foreign, so-called foreign stadiums of, of the uh, opposition and there'd be more people cheering for the Dallas Cowboys than the home team. And so I think they, they contributed greatly to, to well, helping I, that, that Dallas. That's a, a great thing. I was in um, the former Soviet Union in 1983 and I was uh, touring some museum. I don't remember, it wasn't near as good as this one, Stephen. I don't remember which one it was. And anyway, somebody had, uh, there's a bunch of uh, students there, and they said, well, where are you from? And I said, uh, well, I'm from Dallas. They said, really? J.R., who shot J.R.? And I went, oh, my God, you know. And these were East German kids over there visiting the Soviet Union, and they wouldn't know who shot J.R. I told them, of course, anyway, and I, I didn't. Uh, and, of course, we love the Dallas Cowboys. If they could only go back to those thrilling days of yesteryear when they actually thought about a Super Bowl, seriously, that'd be another, another matter. Okay, we just have a minute left. Stephen, give us something that you want that viewer to remember or something you haven't told us yet. 
Well, I, as I said, I think the Sixth Floor Museum is an important part of this community. I think it's helped Dallas uh, come to terms with the assassination. Prior to the museum opening, people would wander the grass of Dealey Plaza looking for answers, talking to street vendors, but the museum provides an opportunity for history and interpretation. It's a meaningful experience, particularly for the young people whose, uh, at this point, even their grandparents, at, at best, have childhood recollections of the Kennedy assassination. So we're, we're moving away from this being a part of collective memory to being an important part of, of our history. I like that. Wes, you have the final words. Well, I think the Dallas Cowboys uh, and the Texas Rangers and Southern Methodist University and Texas Christian are good neighbors. Uh, and the University of Texas at Dallas, if I may put that uh, in there. Thank very you. definitely, very definitely. Mm -hmm. And their great improvements in their beautiful new stadium all helps the image. And, and I think the people of Dallas themselves have a, a quality and a patriotism that is unique and is being appreciated nationwide and worldwide as unique. I appreciate that. Thank you both for joining us. You know, I, I think that most people have now realized that the assassination was not really a Dallas problem. And isn't it ironic that the so-called hate from right-wingers had nothing to do with the assassination and that the assassin was in fact the ultra-left communist Lee Harvey Oswald. Nevertheless, the impact on Dallas was immense and the response of the outstanding Sixth Floor Museum is a testament to Dallas's resiliency. You'll find other programs in this series on JFK on McQuestionTV.com or call and order a DVD of the entire series and you'll see how we continue to talk about things that matter with people who care.